15 says uh, this, and when one of them sat at meat with them, heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servants at supper time to say unto them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they which, with one, one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have brought, uh, bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and uh, therefore I cannot come. <clears throat> so the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said, and said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said to the Lord, It is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of the, these men's which, men which are bidden shall taste of my supper. All right, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll uh, get into this lesson. Father, I pray today you would speak to hearts powerfully, Lord, from someone who doesn't know you to knowing you as Savior to excuses to to understand in your heart to enjoying the blessings of the Christian life and whatever you have for us today Lord I pray you speak to us and I thank you for the word of God thank you for the Holy Spirit who leads and guides us and who convicts us and teaches us and I pray today he'd be evident in this room and we would hear clearly from you each one of us individually I pray today that uh, your word to be anointed and, uh, and empowered and uh, Father we just need you today and uh, we pray you'd uh, do a great work and uh, help us understand your heart and your thoughts. And uh, may it change us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, in this story, a man, a great lord, a king, a certain man had a uh, obviously a huge house. And we don't know, this says a great man. It doesn't say exactly who he was. And uh, he, he wanted to have a feast. And so he invited the important people from town. And he said... Uh, I've, I, he made a huge and understand uh, what it, how what the work it takes to make a huge feast. Back before you had supermarkets and everything else, you had to plan the animals to be there. You had to have them killed and butchered, and and it took a long time to cook them. And you didn't have refrigerators and freezers, and and boy, it's it was an incredible effort to have a great feast. <clears throat> you had to have all your servants and the dishes and the trays, and you had to make sure you had enough dishes for everybody. Can you imagine before paper plates and uh, how you fed everybody? I mean, it's just a lot of work. And uh, and, and so he, he planned and, and he had his servants and people hired and he had he had animals killed and, and, and food picked and things chopped up and, and everything prepared and, and rooms and tablecloths and dishes and, and, and a huge, great feast, it says. He had it all prepared and he invited uh, his friends and invited people. And, and of course, many times back in history when they would have a feast, it was kind of showing off how much wealth you had. They would have a ridiculous amount of food and, and things that are exotic and, and spend a great deal of money to say, look, this is, we have this. We're not, we're not, we're not uh, 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 cheap and we're not scraping and, and we've been blessed. And, and, uh, and so this huge feast is prepared. And well, all of his guests, the, the well-known people in town and the people who uh, were, would come to this type of thing, <clears throat> they began making excuses. They said, we can't make it for this reason and that reason and uh, all these other reasons. And so <laughs> the, 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 the Lord, the, 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 the person over the household is very frustrated. And so he tells the servants to go look for more people. <clears throat> if you look down to verse uh, 21, excuse me. It says, so that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, <clears throat> said unto his servants, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. Well, first thing he does <clears throat> is he goes, excuse me, and uh, <clears throat> All right, you ready? No smoking on Sunday mornings. You got to stop that. And... <clears throat> I have water. So he goes out 
And uh, he says in servants into the city, the servants go around the city and they begin looking for people. He looks for poor people. He looks for lame people, blind people. Uh, he starts looking for different types of people. I think the translators love that. They're translating in Chinese because I have to talk slow. And uh, they can catch up to me. And, uh, and uh, so, <clears throat> but they go and look, walk through town and they go start getting these people. And, and so a bunch of the, the beggars in town, a bunch of the uh, people who don't have anything, <clears throat> they begin to come in. And they begin to eat. But, but he says, hey, master, we've, we've done that, but there's still lots of room. I mean, it's, it's empty out there and the, the tables are empty and they're, they're eating, but they're not going to finish anything. He says, all right, go into the highways and hedges. Now go outside of town and compel them. Try to get them, compel them to come in. And, uh, and so they come in <clears throat> and, uh, and it says in verse 23, the Lord said to the servants, go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Just a few thoughts I want to start off with that, that aren't really my points, but first of all, in history, suppers, and in the Bible, certainly suppers are very important. We don't have suppers here. How many of you are from somewhere they say supper? All right. We don't have supper. We have breakfast, lunch, dinner out here, us Yankees. And uh, and uh, we aren't Yankees in the Northwest, though, I guess, whatever we are. We're weird people. But uh, in this supper, they... they uh, uh, in the Bible, suppers are important. As a matter of fact, when we're raptured, we go to what's called the marriage supper of the Lamb for seven years. Jesus' famous meal was the Last Supper. It was a very social, a very involved event, and so it was a very important thing. And you're saying it's, it's very important, and and how and and they're going to have this. And he thought it was a big deal. Next, he wants his house filled. He wants his house filled, verse 22. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, go out in the highways and hedges. Look, <clears throat> he didn't want his house empty. He wanted it filled. He wanted all the food eaten. He wanted it all taken care of. He wanted it. He said, and the servants went out and got the, the, the people in the city, the beggars and everybody, and they came. And he says, we've done it just said, yet there's room. And he says, no, well, then let's go get more. Go out in the highways. Go out of this, the roads. Go into the hedges. What do you find in hedges? <laughs> I was laughing. I have a pastor friend who's out in the uh, out in the mountains, and uh, he says a whole bunch of people who live out here don't. They're hiding from the government. They don't own this property, and they just move a trailer onto it and stuff. And he says very dangerous when you're door knocking because they think you're a government official, and uh, when you're trying to talk to them, and uh, you're finding people in the hedges. Homeless people, people hiding, people uh, who are lost, people who are uh, people who are who are unknown, people who uh, have no place to go, people who are going to rob people are hiding the hedges. But he says, "Go out in highways and hedges, compel them. I want them in. I want my house full." Now, there's two houses in the Bible, okay, uh, that God talks about. And this, by the way, of course, the the, the good Lord here is 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 uh, this master and. Uh, and the Lord is the master, and, and his house, he has two houses in the Bible and uh, that he wants filled. The first one is heaven. He wants heaven filled. And by the way, there's food in heaven. And he talks about people will sit down with him in heaven, and he talks about it. He describes it. Uh, he talks about food a lot in heaven and marriage supper of the lamb, and, and he talks about eating the fruit from the trees in heaven, and all, there's a lot of description about food in heaven. And... Uh, <clears throat> And, uh, and he says this, let not your heart be troubled. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What does Jesus say? He said, he said to people, different people, hey, before the end of the day, you're going to be, you're going to be eaten in the kingdom of heaven. He says that, look, this is my, this is heaven. And I want heaven full. I want my house in my father's house are many mansions. God wants heaven full. God does not want any room left in heaven. Now, heaven's big. It describes it in Revelation, 1,500 feet wide, 1,500 feet long, 1,500 feet tall. 1,500 feet, year, uh, uh, miles. Uh, there's, there's only 100 of us get to go there. And uh, 1,500 miles. I was wondering why they're looking blankly at me. And, uh, and uh, 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. That's basically the width of the United States. Uh, squared, and then, but then it's stacked 1,500 miles high, okay, uh, which means probably has all the layers for all the people and stuff like that, and, and it's huge, and God says, I want my house filled. 
I want it huge. I want I want people there. It is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. The second house is the church. He calls that his house also in in uh, in First Timothy chapter three. <clears throat> In 1 Timothy chapter 3, he says this, uh, verse 14 and 15, But these things I write unto you, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou knowest how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. What does he say? He says, Timothy, I'm telling you how to behave in the church, because that's my house. When Jesus went and cleaned out the temple, he said, "You should. My house shall be called a house of prayer. God says there's two houses, my father's house, that's my house, and the church, where two or more gathered, I'm in the midst of them. And he says, look, that's the house of God, the pillar of ground of truth. And so he says, church, not necessarily the building, but where the people are gathered, whether it's a house, whether it's a building, wherever it is. And he says, you know what? I want my house filled. Our theme for this fall program has been bursting the nets, breaking the nets, and, 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 and how Jesus told his disciples to go out and, and, and launch out in the deep. And when he, they did that, they pulled in so many fish, their nets break. And in this story, he says, my house, I want it to be full. I want the church to be full. I want, my, I want heaven to be full. The more, the better in these cases. More souls, more people that God loves. And he wants that. I want to give you a few thoughts on this. <clears throat> Once you realize these are the houses that God wants filled and that God has that desire. Number one, he wants his house filled. His guest backed out and he was very frustrated and disappointed. He sends him the streets and lanes of the city, the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. Look, understand, and I mean this, I don't mean this cruelly at all. We, we love poor people and help them all over the world and are involved in everything in the world. But poor people can't bathe a lot of times. Poor people can't give you anything back for what you're doing for them. And I'm not talking about American poor. I'm talking American poor. They have bathtubs and things like that still. But but poor people, and, and it's a sad thing. You know what's crazy? <clears throat> Churches nowadays don't want poor people. They're targeting rich people, people with money. Isn't that, isn't that, a, isn't that tragic? They don't want poor people. And, and, and he says, hey, go get them. Bring them in. Then my house may be filled. Isn't it strange that God gives us this illustration? It's a, it's a parable of Jesus. And he tells you, this is, this is what it's like. This is how, how my father sees the world. He's calling for a great feast. And that's the feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb in, in Revelation uh, uh, 20 and 21. And, and he says, it's, in 22, it's a marriage supper up in heaven. It's where my people, we have a feast together. And, 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 and I want you to understand, I want my house filled. I've made a great feast for my people. In my house, I want filled. And he says, well, man, if they won't come, find somebody else. And his desire is to have his house filled. Then to go into the highways and the hedges. I want to say this. He wants his house filled. He wants heaven populated. He wants his people in his in church, in his house. He, made, he, he developed a church. And I know we're in this day of church isn't good. You don't need to go to church. You can worship God anywhere. All these things people say nowadays, except for the Bible, that would be true. But Jesus developed the church, and he said two or more gathered him amidst them. He gives instructions for what a church is supposed to be like. He made the church. He, he, he gave the system of a church, the pastor and deacons and, 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 and the people, and, <clears throat> and how it's to be organized, and preaching, and, and the singing, and all the things they did in the Bible, and how often they met in the Bible, and how the, the letters in the Bible are written to churches. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And he has these messages over and over for a church. It's God's way. He ordained it. Yes, you can say, well, I can do this and that without this and that. And you can make up your own way, but that's not God's way. Understand that. He wants church. He made it for a reason. And, and, and he wants his people fed in church and fellowshipping and, and giving to missions and, and re- reaching the world and all the things that a church is supposed to do and helping people. That's what God ordained. And he wants his people at his houses. He has a feast. At a church, it's a feasting on the word. And, it's, it's, and he wants people there. And he wants them to hear the word of God in heaven. It's forever with God and to be with him. And that's what God wants. That's his desire. And he wants his house full. If that's true, look at what he does to his servants. He goes to his servants. Down to verse 23. And the Lord said unto his servants, Go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. 
Wow. Look what he says in verse 21, middle of the verse, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither. What a great illustration this is of a Christian's responsibility to witness. I want my house full, so my servants, hey, go. Isn't that word interesting? Go. Great commission. Go ye therefore. Go out and find the people and bring them in. I want my house full. And so God tells the servants, go, leave the house, go out there and find them. By the way, that's the way a church is supposed to be. Understand, we've taught this before, but a church biblically is supposed to be a group of people who get trained and matured at church, and then they go out into the world and reach the world. Then they come back to be matured and bring their, their converts back. Church nowadays, even in a good situation, is usually uh, a church is, is bring them here and we'll preach the gospel to them, and they'll get saved here, which is fine. But that's not the Bible pattern. The Bible pattern is they went out, go ye therefore, and reach all nations. And we go out, each one of us is a missionary. As you walk out the door here, if you look above the door, it'll say you are now entering your mission field. Okay? Because you are supposed to be a witness. You're supposed to be preaching the gospel. You're supposed to, your, 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 your master, your Lord has told you, go out and compel them go. And it's an illustration of how you and I are supposed to be witnesses and loving people and, to, and, and bringing them to the Father and, and going. Not this modern Christianity of sitting around while the lost world dies without Christ. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. Look, the Bible Christians in the book of Acts, they were scattered everywhere preaching the gospel. Every believer. It wasn't just the preachers. Every believer with that urgency, every believer out there in the fields. And that's because God wants that. And that's an illustration of what God wants us to do. Scattering and going and reaching people. There's people you can reach, I won't reach. There's people you're supposed to reach. It's not just about how good a Christian you are. It is also, in addition to that, is you going out and compelling people. Compelling people and trying to find the opportunities. Number one, he wants his house filled. In my father's house are many mansions. Three verses later, he says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the father but by me. Because Jesus saves. Number two, everything is ready. <laughs> Verse 17, is, is, he sent his servants at supper time to say unto them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. <clears throat> you go out there and you look and you see, uh, the, the master looks out there and he says, wow, the food's there. I mean, it's steaming. It's, it, the plates are set out. The table is set out. The entertainers are there. The musicians are waiting. Everything's done. Why isn't anybody here yet? Go out and get them. You know what that's a picture of? With God, with the gospel, everything's ready. Everything's ready for someone to be saved. Everything's ready for someone to come to the Lord. Nothing else needs to be done. It's a wonderful thing. Jesus on the cross, when he was dying, said, It is finished. I've died for all the sins of mankind. I paid all the price. I've done everything that needs to be done. It's been paid for, paid in full. Jesus paid it all. It's finished. Salvation is already paid for. All you need to do is just go and partake of it. Let me take you to Revelation. I'm going to be back there in Luke, but Revelation. I want you to understand that salvation is so wonderful. Getting to heaven is so wonderful because it's already done. It is already finished. All you have to do is go there and enjoy it. You don't have to cook. You don't have to kill the animals. You don't have to earn the meal. Did you catch that? Very important. We see in, 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 in Revelation chapter 21, watch when God's talking about salvation here. It's so good. And, uh, and he's talking about how great heaven is. In verse, uh, <clears throat> verse 3, it says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and shall be their God. And God shall wipe away, wipe away all tears from their eyes. Revelation, this is 21 in verse 4. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Amen. 
And he said unto, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Right, for these things are true. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst, the fountain of the water of life, freely. You want to drink? It's free. Just come get it. Revelation 22 and verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. I want to read to you again another verse. And, uh, and you know, turn there, but it's Isaiah. <clears throat> it says it's all there. You want some? Just come drink it. Just come get it. Take of the water of life freely. Isaiah 55, 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye buy, eat, and come ye uh, buy wine and milk without money and without price. God's invitation for salvation is I've got it. I paid for it. You come get it. But many people think, well, I'm going to try to get to heaven by being good. No, that's not how you get to this feast. Well, I'm going to pay money. He says, I already bought it all and purchased it. You can't earn your way to heaven. Jesus paid for it on the cross. It's not by you being good. It's not by you joining the church. It's not by living a good life. The all things are now ready. It's a free gift. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're sinners. Jesus died for that sin. He paid for it completely. He says, come to me. I paid it all. Just enjoy the meal. Accept salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not complicated. It's not expensive. You don't have to join a club. You don't have to pay a bunch of money. You don't have to do, go do a bunch of good works. You can't do enough good works to get you to heaven. Everything is now ready. <clears throat> what you have to do is be humble and say, I can't be good enough. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. I need Jesus to save me. And he gives you freely. As he said in Revelation, come get the water of life freely. All things are now ready. Salvation is paid for. You'll never get to heaven by trying to be good or by paying for it. Jesus paid for it on the cross. He paid for it, and he paid penny plenty, and he paid enough. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If, it's, if you have to pay for it, it is no longer a gift. Okay, if I said, hey, I want to give you my car here, and it's a gift to you, $500. You say, well, that's a good deal, but it's not a gift. The gift of God is eternal life. If I said one penny, my car is still not a gift. And if salvation costs you, it's not a gift. God says it's free. I paid for it. The person who buys the gift pays the price. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price. You get the free gift if you want it. He died for it. And so everything is now ready. What a wonderful thing. He wants you in heaven. There is room. He accepts anyone. He tells them, go get anybody who will come. Whosoever, anybody, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. For God so loved the world. God wants anybody. Jesus said, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So every once in a while somebody thinks, well, God wouldn't want me. No, he wants everybody in his house. The feast is prepared. Jesus already paid for your sins. He wants you. The price has already been paid for it. There's nobody he doesn't want. There's nobody he won't accept if they'll come to him for salvation. It's for everybody. For God so loved the world. He paid for everybody. There's lots of room. Everything is totally ready. If you're not born again today, if you don't know heaven's your home, today's your day to accept it. His, he wants you to come. He's paid the price, and he's done that. Next, boy, I tried to think of how to say this <clears throat> pastorally, but I couldn't figure it out. And so, uh, number three, our excuses are lame. Our excuses are lame. Uh, Luke 15. Luke 15. I'm sorry, Luke 14. Sorry, Luke 14. Thy reason that thou hast put forth, 
are not acceptable thereof. Okay. Luke 14, verse 18. All things are now ready, verse 17, verse 18. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. They didn't come. Why? Excuses. Excuses. I laugh and some new pastors, they'll come out and they'll start a church and they'll, they'll talk to me and say, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe the reasons people give for not coming to church. I said, I would. My wife was telling us a story about how when she was in school, my wife was a straight A student, two Sue and all that stuff, and and uh, and she was uh, she she, uh, she her sister ate her homework one time, and her little sister, and uh, and her, and they gave her an award for the best excuse of the year in that class uh, for not turning her homework. Her, my sister ate it, and it wasn't even the dog and uh, excuses. They began to make excuse, and one said, oh, just, for, just excuse me. Verse 18, and when they were all of one consent, began to make excuse. And the first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. Let's just stop there. And I pray that you have me excused. Just stop for a sec. God's going to tell these, these excuses, and he makes them lame. You know why? Because God doesn't accept excuses. <laughs> and so he shows you... In God's heavenly perspective, this is what I think of your excuses. Okay, first one. I purchased a piece of land and I need to go see it. Let me be excused. Logic for a sec. How many people buy a piece of land and then want to go see it? Okay. If you do that, why do you have to go right then? You've already bought it. Why can't you go to the feast and then go look at your land. God says, it's lame. Let's see the next excuse. Okay. <clears throat> I bought me a piece of land. I must go see it. I pray they have me excuse. Verse 19, another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm, I go to prove them. Okay. Why do you go buy five yoke of oxen and then go try and see if they're good workers? And... Why can't you do that tomorrow? You've already bought them. Lame. Next one's even worse. Verse 20. Another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. What woman doesn't want to go to a big group of people? I mean, look, why would you not be social because you got married? Look, buddy, you just got married. You're going to need money. And you got a feast for free. Go! And and let me be excused. I married a wife. Well, go and celebrate. They'll all say cheers for you at the meal. And you can, your wife will need to eat. And it'll be okay if you eat after you're married. It's okay. And, but the excuses are lame. Now, I'll get myself in a little trouble here. I don't think American. I just don't. I, I, I have not for a long time. I think much differently than American thinks. I understand that. I understand. Look, it's because it a lot of reasons. I don't watch TV. A lot of the reasons that I don't think like an American thinks. Most of it's because of being impacted by, by, by very dedicated Christians and going to the third world. And the people I've seen come to church that don't make excuses... People, and reading history of Christians who are, who are, and, and people who are in our church today, who were in a closed country and went to church anyway at risk of arrest. Okay, and people who who have hard times. Look, I was in I was in Zambia, Africa, and I was at a church, and in that church, in that church, we had people who crossed the border from um, uh, Botswana. And came to the church for the service there. Now, to understand that, passing from one border to another in Africa is not like doing it from Canada to America. It's troublesome. It's disorganized. 
It's it's a disaster. And you have to get on a boat to do that. And you have to cross a river on a boat. And then you have, and you have to walk it. And another group came to this church uh, to come here. The American, boy, they get disappointed. And, uh, and came 12 hours. How'd they get there? Bike. I was in the same country. And I was standing outside the church after Sunday morning, and there was this old lady there. And, and, and she was one a really old lady, bent over, sweet lady in Zambia, Africa. And she's walking like this. You know the people who take, you hate getting behind? Stooped over. And he says, Pastor, she does that two and a half hours each way to get to church. She won't get home. She'll walk like that for two and a half hours to get home. And people in America, well, my team's playing today. <laughs> well, you know, I'm just kind of not feeling good. I'm just kind of tired. Look, read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Okay. Get out of your spoiled America. If, if, if I wake up, I have a bad hair day, then I'm not going to church. Look, I have a bad hair life. <laughs> and I still go, okay? We make a lot of excuses. And God doesn't accept them. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't make excuses when he had every reason not to go to the cross? Aren't you glad the Apostle Paul, when he's getting beaten from town to town and thrown into prison and open wounds and killed and shipwrecked, he said, I got to keep preaching the gospel instead of making excuses. And he had excuses. And have excuses. God didn't accept it. God didn't accept him. Look what he says here. They all made excuse. In verse 20, it says, Another said, I have married and wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and showed his Lord these things. And the master of the house being angry. God just notes that. I'm not happy about this. I remember my wife and I were in her Bible college. I, I, I relate to this a little bit. We're in Bible college. Everybody's poor, poor, poor at Bible college. And the economy was terrible there. The, the, the college didn't take any government loans. So there wouldn't be any government control. And, uh, and, and, and so all these students were all working and trying to pay the college bills and doing ministry and everything. We're all, we're all poor. My wife and I are married. And there's a bunch of single students who couldn't get home for, for Thanksgiving. And so we invited a, several of them uh, to our house. And we were poor. And uh, we, we, we made a big, nice meal. And we had a whole big Thanksgiving meal. And we had three of them say they're going to come. And we sat there. And none of them showed. And I, well, nobody had cell phones back then. And, uh, and so I saw him on Monday. I said, hey, man, we're looking for you. So where were you? He said, oh, I couldn't come. I said, well, could you have told me? We spent the money. I had turkey sandwich. Well, that's awesome, though. Leftover turkey is the best, isn't it? And I had turkey sandwiches for six months. But, uh, and I don't care if it's six months old. It doesn't matter to me. And uh, expiration dates are for wimps. And, uh, but, uh, <clears throat> But boy, when you do all that and go, but that was, that was rude. We spent the money. We were waiting. We set up the house. We, 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 we did a bunch of extra things and, and God gives you church. He gives you his word. He makes excuses why he can't read it. Excuses why he can't go witnessing. Excuses. Lame. Excuses why he can't give. Excuses why he can't pray. Excuses why he can't love. God says, excuse me, they're lame. I've always said, people say, I can't come to church tonight. I'm going to come in the morning. If I was giving $1,000 a night, would you be able to make it? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just priorities, excuses. You know, that Bible that sits and gets dusty on your shelf, you know, Christians who are risking their lives to carry Bibles and to translate Bibles throughout history, if they knew you had a Bible and you have your own Bible, and you don't read it, and you say, well, I just kind of sleepy at night. And stop with the I don't have time thing, by the way. I don't have time. It's a terrible excuse. I've said it a million times, no internet, no video game, no TV. Don't turn any three of those on at all. 
and then tell me if you still don't have time. People always have time when the power goes out, it seems like. Okay. Yeah. Look, when you go, when you go, <clears throat> and I've done the math with people a thousand times, they say, I don't have time. I say, how many hours a week you work? 40? Okay, how, how was your travel time? Hour a day. Okay. So we're at 45 hours. Got 168 hours in the week. How many hours of sleep do you need tonight? Eight. Okay. We're up to 85 hours. Okay. We got about another 60 hours. You, you don't have time to read your Bible, you said? How many hours? How many hours you need? You know what? Let's not do 60 hours of Bible reading. Why don't you just do a half hour a day? But you can make an excuse. And your excuses will be legitimate for you. I married a wife, I bought oxen, I bought land. And you can justify whatever you want. And I'm just telling you, God didn't take your excuses. If the government says you can't witness, and they're going to persecute you, and they're going to put you in jail, you're still supposed to witness. Let alone your lame excuse. How we doing? If the government says we catch you reading your Bible, we're going to put you in jail and take away your home and take away all you own. You still read your Bible. But what excuse does the devil give you that's not even as good as that? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Byram. Thank you. Amen. Excuses are lame. Lame. Stop. If God wants you to be saved, be saved. Quit making excuses. God wants you to go to church, go to church. Quit making excuses. God wants you to love somebody. Yeah, they're hard to love. Quit making excuses. Love them. God has excuses he could use on you too. <laughs> if God wanted not to love me, he's got plenty of reasons. But he loves me anyway. He overcomes instead of making excuses. He does it anyway. Life's tough. Look, if you're a good worker, you go to work when you don't feel like it sometimes. You can make excuses. And there, you've seen people at work get fired because they made excuses all the time. But how about in the spiritual life not making excuses? How about quitting blaming somebody else? How quitting saying it's too tough? It is tough. Toughen up. Life's tough. If you want to serve God, you got to be tough. Jesus was tough. He sweat drops of blood for you and didn't make excuses. He went to the cross. Don't be a wimp. Don't make excuses. Don't make excuses. We're in a soft generation. We're in a soft world. And everybody's, when it gets hard, everybody's like, well, God must not want me to do it. It's hard. Stop. You'll never serve God that way. You're fighting demons and devils. And excuses and whining and it's just tough out there. No. You want tough out there, go with me on a mission trip. We'll show you tough out there. Your life in America is not that tough. Okay? You're not walking two and a half hours one step every two seconds. Okay? Toughen up and say, I'm going to quit making excuses and do what I'm supposed to do. It's called adulthood. It's called a Christian. It's called being strong in the Lord. It's called overcoming. Okay? That's what God wants. He did it for us. We love him. We'll do anything for him. We're not going to, we're going to quit making excuses. We're going to quit blaming. We're going to quit saying it's tough. We're going to say it's tough, but I'm going to do it anyway. And don't make excuses. But excuses are lame. Just do what God wants you to do. How much do you want? Look at verse 24. <clears throat> Does God excuse, excuse it? Look at verse 24. For I say unto you, none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Oh. Remember, the bidden ones were the ones who were called first. So use the phrase at the start of the story. The ones who were bidden were the first ones who were, were supposed to come. He says, hey, if they want to come, they're not coming in the door now. Because their excuses were lame. <laughs> And by the way, when you miss opportunities, you don't get them back many times with Christ in the Lord. You just missed it. You just missed your chance. The, the food's eaten. <laughs> and so you missed it. God doesn't, don't, they can't come now. Don't make excuses. We make too many excuses for things. Everything's got to be perfect in our lives. Every, every situation's got to be worked out just fine. Everybody's got to be just right and set up just right. Everything's not just feeling just right and just right. No. Just do right. When it's hard, when it's awkward, when you don't feel like it, when you're tired, when you're doing all, just just do right. Do what God wants you to do. Last of all, I want to say this. Be a blessed beggar. 
be a blessed beggar. A couple guys sitting in town. <clears throat> One guy's blind, sitting there with his dish in his hand. Skinny, wearing rags. No government assistance back then. The other guy sitting next to him has one, one leg and the other one isn't there in rags, holding a, a little, little bowl, a dirty bowl. They're both dirty. They're both smelly. They're both hungry. They take a little bit of money, maybe every day. If they get money, they walk down, their friends, they walk down and they grab themselves a little fish and they split the fish, whoever gets more food that day, and they eat a little fish. Uh, maybe they go down and get a little bit of meal of some sort and they, they and then they go and sleep in a little shack or maybe sleep out there under the stars because they have nothing. And those are beggars. One day a man walks up to them, a man's wearing kind of nice clothes, says, hey, you guys, come with me. You want some food? Come with me. This guy, for real, the blind guy says, says, hey, looks like it. I don't know. Let's go. And the lame guy gets up with his stick and the blind reach and the blind guy goes to them and they, they guide them along the way and they start going towards a rich part of town. Ooh. And they start going there and, 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 and all of a sudden they go and then they see up on a hill is this beautiful, massive castle. And the man starts leading them up there. And all of a sudden he says, hey, hold on, let's get you guys a wagon. It puts them in the wagon. And in the wagon that comes along, there are other people who are beggars from around town. All them poor. There is deaf people and there's lame people and dirty people and people with nothing. And they've all seen each other because they all sleep outside in the same places. They're all poor and they have nothing. And all of a sudden they get into the wagon and ride up the hill. And they start saying to the driver, driver, I don't think they'll allow us into that place. I'm not... Uh, he says, don't worry, it's fine. And they ride up the front and in they walk into these royal doors opening up. And they start smelling it. Well, they're not used to smelling good food. And they go, are we in trouble? That's the first thing we ask, are we in trouble? <laughs> and they go inside. And all of a sudden, here's this massive, long table, longer than this room, and another table and chairs all around it and beautiful tablecloth. And you ever been dirty and go to somewhere clean? Like, oh, should we sit down there? And the, the lame guy starts talking to his blind friend. And so there's these huge tables and these silver platters. There's this huge turkey and there's, there is a big giant stuck pig all the way through the middle and there's chicken and there's there's there is meat and there's hamburger and there's cow and there's and there's vegetables and there's there's fruit and 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 apples and oranges and and there's and there's all these wonderful things look at that there's biscuits and gravy because in this story you gotta have biscuits and gravy and 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 there's ribs and there's bacon burgers because it's, it's kind of an illustration of heaven. And so, you know, and, and there's all these incredible things. And I was like, I can smell it. And look at all those different types of drinks. And all oh, this is incredible. And they walk and sit down and all these servants come down. And here's this servant and puts this napkin on his lap. What's that for? I think it's something he put in his head or something. I don't know. What and they begin stacking food like this has got to be a setup i'm not gonna eat it we're not supposed to eat this there's no way and then also they see some other beggars start eating have you ever been somewhere where you it was way nicer and way better than you thought it was going to be no um i had one time where i was at a uh <laughs> I was at a pastor's conference and they said, we're going to, we're going to take all you pastors out to a, a meal at one of our a members house. And we didn't know the member was, was an, I think she was a top real estate agent in the state of California, very wealthy. It was a mansion up on a hill. And I remember to, for, for this meal, she built a $40,000 addition to her deck. Okay. And that was, this is 17 years ago, 16 years ago. And just for this meal with us. And so anyway, um, we're in a big line and she's walking along and find all the pastor's wives and giving them all $50 bills. And I'm like, whoa, where's my wife? And, uh, and she wasn't there. And, uh, 
And, uh, and, and so anyway, I, I get up and we get, and they had a catered meal up there. And so I get up and, and it's a gazebo they had built and we go to this big gazebo and I, I grab the plate. You know, it's what's always first in any big old, big old meal. It's first salad. What I start doing, I start scooping the salad. It's a nice salad, pretty fancy, got all the fixings. And the guy next to me, pastor says, Hey brother, you better look behind you before you do that. And I turn around and look, there was steak, lobster, crab. I mean, every kind of expensive food you can imagine. I said, I mean, you would not believe the feast of this place. I couldn't believe it. Off I went past the salad. Salads for bunnies. And uh, and, and off I go back. And <clears throat> at the end, they had haagen ice cream at the end. And that's all I got, just a pile of plate of that. And, uh, and all this incredible food. I was like, this, man, I never eat this stuff, man. This isn't for, this is not what us poor folks get. I'm happy, but I'm happy with the bacon burger. And, uh, and boy, this, this guy starts eating, starts eating the food. He just sits there and he's like, man, nobody's stopping us. There's so much food here. We can never eat it all. And they just start eating and eating. I, said, I don't know what we did. We're not worthy of this, but we're going to enjoy it. And they start eating and drinking and eating and drinking and swelling and oh, I get another bite. They say, there's dessert. Okay, I can eat another bite. And, uh, and, and boy, they start eating and, they're, and they enjoy it. And it's wonderful. They have a feast. They don't even know why they don't deserve. They didn't do anything, but they're enjoying it. That's me. That's you. I don't deserve to go to heaven someday. I'm not worthy of it. I don't deserve the blessings of having the Holy Spirit inside of me, having the word of God. I don't deserve, and you don't deserve the blessings that God's given to you, but be a blessed beggar. Enjoy it. You got to come. He invited anybody. The worst of the worst. You say, man, who am I? I shouldn't even be in church. No, none of us probably should. It's by the Lord's mercies we're not consumed. But since God has been so good to us and made the feast and made it ready, I'm sure going to enjoy this Christian life. I'm going to enjoy serving the Lord. I'm going to sing his praises. I'm going to love serving him. I'm going to do his work. I'm going to be his friend. I'm going to enjoy being friends with God. I'm going to pray and enjoy the blessings. And in heaven, I'm going to praise God that I get to be there, though I don't deserve any of it. Why am I preaching here today? I have no idea. Why did God call me? I think you got the wrong number. But listen, if somebody calls you and says, hey, I get a million dollars for you. Where do I meet you, uh, Bob? And you're not Bob? Go meet him anyway. And, uh, and, and you know what? If God called me, I'm going to enjoy serving God. I'm going to enjoy the Christian life. I'm going to be a happy beggar. The you rich people didn't show up for it. Their loss. I'm going to enjoy serving God. And that's what it's all about is enjoying serving God. That's the parable of the Great Supper. There's some great lessons for us to learn. Let me review and we'll finish. First of all, uh, he wants his house filled. Secondly, everything's ready. Thirdly, our excuses are lame. And lastly, be a blessed beggar.